Well, today is our last Sunday with the Christ to Culture series, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a uh, bump in the road compared to what we've been doing lately, because um, as it pertains to Christ to Culture, we've been generally looking at how Jesus would speak to the culture around us, the culture at large, the secular culture, the world as we would call it, Uh, but this morning I want to finish up the Christ to Culture series by talking how would Jesus speak to the church culture. What would Jesus say about the church culture in 21st century Western world goings on? What would Jesus say to the church culture today? And we're going to focus specifically on something. The the whole point this morning was to get to talking about the sins of the tongue. And the sins of the tongue are things like gossip and slander. Uh, They're things like um, lying, deceit. Sends the tongue where you use your words to communicate things that are destructive, that go against the purposes of God. And as I was thinking about this in relationship to how do you preach this, because the thing that, that uh, Pastor Josh and Pastor Justin and I have thought about when it came to this issue was we, we thought social media is rife with examples of how destructive words can be. And to be honest, uh, professing Christian people are not exempt from this. And to be perfectly honest with you, it is very disheartening to see that some people who love Jesus will go on social media and use the tongue of their little fingers typing on their phone to unleash some vitriolic words that are destructive and hurtful and go far, 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 far from building the cause of Christ and his kingdom. And so as we thought about this, we thought, okay, social media is a huge problem. And then I wanted to kind of focus on, well, how is it then that we can speak about this issue? How do we address this issue with some sense of broader perspective of, uh, of cohesion when we think about using the tongue, using words wisely? I thought this is something that Jerry Bridges called an acceptable sin. It's a respectable sin. It's something that um, people in the church have, and, and this has gone on to be sure for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but people have been willing to look at other sin issues and say, wow, that's a really, really, really awful thing, and yet there's an issue like slander, there's an issue like gossip that people will engage in freely within the church and they don't think it's that bad. People engage in sins of the tongue within the life of evangelical churches quite regularly and with great destructive power. And when I thought, how do we package this up? How do we finish up this Christ to Culture series? We're going to have a little gap the next two weeks as we prepare for the Gospel of Luke and back to church Sunday. We'll have a couple of weeks talking about why we want people to be in corporate worship. But for this week, I want to wrap up Christ to Culture by saying you are not exempt as a Christian from hearing how would Jesus speak to the um, predilections that we have within the evangelical church. We want to see Jesus change not just the world around us or change our perspective on the world around us. We want Jesus to change the culture that exists within the life of the evangelical church. And so this morning we are talking about the sins of the tongue and I have titled it, I think, aptly tolerating the untamed tongue. Christ to church culture. So we will be looking at James chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. It's familiar for you if you are familiar with the book of James, right in the middle of the book And some pretty strong words. So I'm going to read this for us. James says, If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So here's our big idea. It is not too much to say that should Jesus speak to contemporary Western church culture, that's us, there would be much to say about the way that those who profess to belong to him tolerate the use of the tongue to sin and, to be clear about this, the silence of lips to open when they should. I do not simply want this morning as we, as we talk about the tongue and sins of the tongue and how does a culture deal with this? How do we deal with this? I don't want to just simply focus on like, don't do these bad things. Don't slander. Don't gossip. Don't maliciously talk. Don't lie. Those are bad things. Avoid them, please. But God gave us tongues for a reason. It wasn't just to not use them. It wasn't to close our lips. He gave us lips and a tongue to use them. And the whole point of being redeemed, to fast forward a little bit here to how we're going to close things up this morning, the whole point of being redeemed is that God redeems you so you can use the things that were once used in sinful employment, that you can use them wisely and rightly. And so when we think about this this morning, I want us to think the culture out there, the church culture out there, people out there, we can't change that. And we can't expect people out there to change because unless somebody knows Jesus, unless the Holy Spirit is at work in somebody's heart, it's it's like asking a fig tree to produce grapes. It's not going to happen. But for those who profess faith in Christ, we should have every expectation that we go to the Lord and say, please change me. And the desire is to change, the desire is to grow. We have every expectation that we can pursue this and find success as we pursue it together. So that is where we are going. The remarkable act of speech. Here's some background. In the past several weeks we've been doing this. We've talked about a lot of background that's rooted in Genesis as we think about these issues that are culturally important, culturally significant. So before we get to talking about the specific issues of how we sin with our tongue and how we ought to use it, I want to look a little bit at the importance of it. Why does it matter so much how we use words? Why is it significant that when the Apostle Paul goes through a list of all the different things that that demonstrate the depravity and the wickedness and the evil of humanity, that he spends an extended time talking about how the, the way words are used are reflective of that? Why is that? So Genesis 1, 1 through 3, we've heard this several times over the past eight weeks. Let's see how this ties into this issue. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. So to put this in perspective for you, where we're gonna go here to just lay this groundwork, lay this foundation about why speech and words and language are important and should be prioritized for the Christian is because from all of eternity, God is a speaking God. He communicates within the Trinity. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are communicating with each other. Jesus himself makes it very clear that that he had a love from the Father that existed from before the world ever was created. And so when we think about God's relationship with himself, we think back on, on eternal history before humans existed and God was eternally happy with himself, experienced fellowship within the Trinity. That's a truth. That's a beautiful thing. And there is speech that exists there. And we'll see in a second just how Jesus is related to this idea of speech. But he communicates within the Trinity and with creation through the use of language that establishes and reflects truth. God cares about language. And as you just saw in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, you see that God said that there be light. God used words to speak creation into being. Okay, this is very different from what a lot of different religious systems and worldviews would communicate. It would say, well, there's this existent material and a deity of some sort came and took this and fashioned it and said, oh, here's this creation. And that's not what happened. You have in the Bible Moses revealing that God used fiat, not the car. You don't want a fiat. You don't want one of those. But God used fiat, which is basically it's a command that says this is going to be. God said, and it happened. God said, and it happened. Language is on display from the beginning. 
John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let's see how Jesus ties into this when we think about the eternal nature of God as a speaking God. John says, in the beginning was the word. Sounds familiar, what we just read in Genesis. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So how does this have anything to do with language? Well, Jesus here is called the word. Word, okay? There's a, there's a Greek concept that's at work here that I don't want to really get into to talk about too much, but it's enough to say that there is something very deep and profound about the fact that Jesus has an identity as the eternal word of God. The eternal word of God. So we think about God speaking. You look at the book of John. You see how Jesus reveals himself over and over and over again. He uses speech acts to communicate things. He says, I am this. I am this. I am this. I am this. Over and over and over. He uses speech to identify himself. And so we have God revealing himself through language, through words. Words matter to God because from all of eternity, God has used this notion of language to communicate his character. Let's go back then to Genesis chapter one. I want you to see this here. And God said that there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. So the first day we have this happening. God said that there be light. Now I want you to see what verse five says after that. It says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Do you see where language is displayed here again? Because not only does God speak creation into existence, but it says here that God called it day. He called it night. He gave it definition through language. And as you watch through the book of Genesis, the first chapter, over and over and over again, you're going to find the same cycle repeated where God speaks into being and then he defines it. He says, I call this this. I will call this that. God defines through language what things will be. God's speech causes things to be and defines what they are. And this is how it relates to us and how we use language. As those created in God's image, God has given us the ability to use language to understand the world truly and to provide definition to the human experience. This is very contrary to uh, if, if you are my generation or younger, you have gone to school in a context where you have been taught that truth is malleable, that truth is not knowable. That truth is something that you can make for yourself, define for yourself, that truth is not even a relevant concept to how existence works because truth is merely a figment of one's own imagination and how one feels and you can make truth for yourself. And so there's these ridiculous phrases that show up again and again and again saying things like, you should live your truth. That, That means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It's a worthless statement, but people hear that and it's like, oh yeah, you be you, live your truth. These are statements that are worthless, they're meaningless, because all they're communicating is you define reality for yourself. And I hope you see in that how when we think about the culture around us and how it's infecting our view of language and words and how we live, I want you to see the subtlety of how Satan acted in the garden. He said, You can be like God. You can be like God. You can be like God. And you think today, well, live your truth. You can be like God. You can be like God. You can be like God. Define it for yourself. You provide definition. Instead, the way that God created us in his image is to look at the world around us and he's given us this really amazing gift that's different than any of the other created beings that we see on this earth and the ability to use language to define things. Okay, uh, I will say this, I'm not a huge fan of art paintings, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, in fact, I had a class, I think Brandon Stremkowski actually had this professor as well, uh, in art history class when I was at Point years ago, and it was an art history class that I was real tempted to fall asleep in pretty regularly. But there's one period of art that I really, really appreciated, and it's this period of art from the 1600s until the early 1800s where people decided to use art to make things as realistic as possible. I can't stand abstract art. Really can't stand it. But what I love when it comes to painting and artwork is to see somebody try to represent what is there with absolute clarity. 
And the way that God has called us to use language is similar to that. It's to say, use words to define things clearly. Use words to define things for what they actually are. Don't use words to muddy the waters. Don't use words to, to muddle things up. Use words to be precise. Use words to be clear. And use words to reflect what's true. He's given us that gift in our human experience. I want you to think about this in terms of your relationships with people. And you think the more you get to know somebody, the more you can define who they are. You know who they are, and then you can speak about that. The deeper of a relationship you have, the more you can provide definition. Uh, One of my favorite things about being a dad is the fact that I've gotten to name my kids. And that isn't just a power play of some kind of masculine, I'm going to name my kids. There's something really special to me about naming my kids because it represents for me what my hope and prayer is for each of those children. There's significance to their names. And so when you name something, you're saying, this is what I want to define it with. Language matters because it helps us define what we're looking at and understanding. Language is significant. See how this happens right away after man is created, how God gives us this gift. He says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So you see here how God delegates this responsibility of definition through language because Adam is given the responsibility of naming these creatures. I mean, you think what, what, a, what a strange experience that would have been where you were made and you have no context for anything else and these things are brought in front of you and this God who made you says you can give them names. You can define them. And so... Adam is like, that looks like an elephant. Looks like a giraffe. I mean, just imagine what that would have been. I've had these conversations, ridiculous conversations with my son Simeon, where he'll ask me things like, why is that called an orange? And I'll tell him, I have no idea, son. I have no idea why it's called an orange. But you think, why is something called what it is? We use language to define things. And you look right at the beginning. God gives this delegating privilege of looking. And you look at this most precious gift that he gives to Adam in his wife. It's like, Adam, you can name her. You can name her. This precious gift I've given you to be your perfect complement so you two will function perfectly together. You have the privilege of giving her a name. Just what an amazing perspective to consider God's delegating language to us to be used wisely. And then finally, with the Bible, God has made clear to us that he cares deeply about how words are used as he has supplied and preserved a clear record of exactly what he wants us to know by way of language concerning who he is, what he has done, and how we understand existence. You see, in the fact that we have the Bible the clearest display of the truth that God cares about words. He doesn't just tell us, behave ethically, behave morally, do what feels good to you. He gives us this book filled with history. We talked about this at men's group the other night where he talked about how the book of Genesis does not give room for anybody to believe that it's something other than an historical account. It's not written with a sense of, well, these are stories to be emulated. Instead, the author is very clear that this is truth. He's recording history. God has given us a book filled with true statements, historical facts, and along with that, the record of what he has done and who he is. In the scriptures, we find this. So when the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's talking about the ministry that he's given to him, he says, this word of God, this Bible, this book that you have been entrusted with, 
This is breathed out by God himself. God himself has said these words and you steward these words. You take care of these words because these words matter more than any words you'll ever encounter. Language is important to God. So what's the trouble? The trouble is this. Back to the book of James chapter three and this is where we're gonna start getting into a little bit more of the what's going on and how do we deal with it. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So think about your own experience for a second before we go on to, to think about this truth. And I am sure all of us have had moments that stick out in our lives that may have been decades ago that somebody said something to you that sticks with you that hurt Okay. Most of us, it was something said in high school. An experience where somebody else said something and just dumped on us this mess of self-loathing because they say something about us we don't like, we recognize we don't like it about ourselves, and then something proceeds to trigger from there where we just develop this horrible, horrible, horrible picture of ourselves because somebody said something. It's because they used words. Words do have significant power to damage. And as we get into talking in just a few minutes about how this works within the life of the church, I want to take very seriously the fact that words damage people. And not to minimize things that happen to people physically, but I would say words can damage just as badly, just as badly, than if somebody physically injures you. Keep that in your mind because it's important that we take seriously the call that God has for us to use our tongues wisely. Now because the tongue reveals what's in the heart of the one using it, when sin infects the human heart, the tongue reflects what's behind it. Jesus spoke about this really, 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 really clearly as he's speaking to people who thought themselves to be righteous didn't do the bad, evil things that the people around them did. And yet, Jesus talks about what's going on in here and how their mouths reflect it. Matthew records these words. He called the people to him. Jesus called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father is not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. The sense of self-righteousness that people experience because they don't do things with their hands that we consider to be evil. That sense of self-righteousness is very present within the evangelical church today. I've been off of Facebook for a few years now. and It's been great in a lot of ways. But I will say this. I left Facebook around the time of the 2016 presidential election. And regardless of one's politics, I will say this, the opportunities that Christian people have had to represent Jesus in the public square through social media have largely been taken with opportunities to be really, 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 really awful to people. 
to be clear, there's nothing wrong with putting political opinions or memes out. It's fine as long as you keep it within a certain degree of appropriateness. But man, I have seen, and, and to be clear here, we talk politically both sides of the spectrum because there are people that I know and love very dearly who have been hurt by people who have said some pretty ridiculous things through social media posts. But when we think about, well, I don't do bad things, what I would ask any Christian person to consider is, are you using your words on social platforms to communicate God-honoring, Christ-exalting things, or do you use your words on social media platforms to do self-exaltation? Do you use words on social media platforms to just diminish the value and worth of people that you don't like or you don't agree with? It's so important that we understand the potential that we have to use words in a way that harm other people. And as we move in a few minutes to talk about how we can use words rightly to think, is there a better way? Is there a better way to use a social media platform than to do something that is building my own kingdom? Is there a better way? And I think there is. But I think this is one of the greatest liabilities the evangelical church has today. Is well-meaning Christians without thinking will go ahead and rifle things off that end up doing terrible damage to other people and the cause of Christ because they're not seeing Jesus reflected in the way the words come across the screen. Jesus also says this in Matthew, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And man, this is, again, social media just reflects this for me. I have seen, and thankfully I'm not, I'm not seeing this stuff from Christian people, so praise the Lord. I'm seeing irresponsible words that get tossed out there at times, but not this kind of stuff. When I will go and I will look at like Twitter comments on, on news stories, I cannot believe the type of language that people use. And I'm not talking potty mouth language. I'm talking about people speaking to complete strangers who have a different perspective than them, literally saying things, I hope you die. Like, you think about this, and if you were to go up to a stranger on the street and say, oh, who'd you vote for? I hope you die. That is the most insanely inappropriate thing, but what does Jesus have to say about it? It says, well, it's coming right out of here. It's not because you disagree with somebody and you're just kind of anonymously talking. It's, that's really what's happening inside of here. The way you're using that screen, the way you're using that account, the way you're using that social media platform, that's much more indicative of what's actually going on inside of you than the way that you behave properly in front of others. Again, thankfully, I'm not seeing Christian people go to those lengths. But boy, that temptation is always there because inside you're just thinking, this is how I feel, this is how I feel, and I'm real tempted to write this. Why? Consider your heart. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 3 as he talks about the depravity of humanity. I referred this earlier. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. So as Paul is explaining the sinfulness of humanity, universally, he goes on to describe the sinfulness of humanity like this. Quoting from the Psalms, he says, As it is written, None is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. So that's the indictment, the universal indictment. How is that reflected, Paul? How are, you, how are you making this case? He says, their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's so easy to think their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. We think, oh, this is nasty, evil, awful people out there who are doing these bad things. But Paul is saying, think about the fact that the sinfulness of humanity is reflected in the way that people use their words. He says, they use their tongues to deceive. Have you ever been lied to? How have you felt when somebody's lied to you? They just use words. 
They didn't take a tire iron and beat you with it. They used their words. They lied to you. How did it feel to be lied to? The venom of asps is under their lips. He's equating here the way that people speak. He's equating it with how a snake will strike a victim and inject venom into them and paralyze them. He's saying that kind of venom exists right inside here. As James says, this tiny little organ, this tiny little thing, this tongue, has the ability to inject venom into people. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. just keeps pouring out, keeps pouring out keeps pouring out. I remember a few years ago, um, we had a men's group time, and one of the guys in the group was talking about when he first came to know Jesus, one of the things that was a real tip-off for him that something significant had happened is he had gone for decades not caring one bit about using God's name in vain, and he was having a conversation. I think it was just a kid, like a little kid, and the kid used God's name in vain, and he like physically recoiled. People say it's just a word. It's not a word, it's a reflection of the heart. What's going on inside the human heart is often most clearly reflected with words because we can't always go out and do something. But you can talk about it. You can talk about it and you can do it freely. How do we use words? Well, the church is rightly willing to call out any other number of legitimate sin issues as sinful. Far too often, we, the church, we tolerate sins of the tongue as though they can be winked at without evaluating the heart they actually reflect. I want to read this passage from Proverbs 26 before we go on here. This is so important to see. This is the seriousness with which we are to take these matters Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper, quarreling ceases. As charcoal the hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. What is a quarrelsome man? This guy uses words to be an idiot. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. And to be clear, a whisperer is talking about a gossip. Somebody who hears things and has to just go tell somebody about it. No context, no perspective. Just has to go tell somebody about it. Use words carelessly. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Maybe you've been in a conversation with somebody where you've heard gossip and you've been thinking, I don't like that person. It's really good to know that about them now. I knew I didn't like them. Now I have a reason. Somebody gossiped to you. Tasted good. Like the glaze covering an earthen vessel and our fervent lips with an evil heart. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. A lying tongue hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin." Again, think about your experience. You ever had a conversation with somebody who's buttered their speech with you and you either know that they're buttering it or you find out later that they did in order to get something from you, take advantage of you? Words have terribly significant power and the way that sinful humanity employs words, even though it may not feel as physically harmful as somebody coming and damaging you with, with uh, a, a swat in the butt. Words are used more carelessly and more prevalently, and I would say with more regularly damaging power than anything else that we employ as a tool for sin. Paul says this to the church in Corinth. I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. As Paul talks to a really messed up church, a really confused church, a really, really, really going south church, he doesn't say, I'm afraid that when I show up, 
I might find all the dead bodies of your serial killing murder victims under your floorboards. He says, here's what I'm afraid I'm going to find. Because he's not, he doesn't have email, doesn't have text, doesn't have anything like that. He's going to show up and he says, here's what I'm afraid I'm going to find. I'm afraid I'm going to find that your church has been plagued with gossip. I'm, I'm afraid that when I show up, I'm going to hear that people are slandering others. When I show up, I'm afraid that I'm going to hear that there is hostility and anger being reflected in the words people are speaking. That's what he was afraid of. And as a pastor, I understand, to a degree at least, what Paul is saying here. Because 95% of the church conflict I've ever been in a position to deal with has had to do with words. Not people out there having affairs, not people out there beating each other up, people using words to destroy others. It is an epidemic in the church because we don't take it seriously. We don't guard this the way we should because we think it's our right and privilege to use it however we feel like. And that's evil. Paul was afraid the church would look like this. The question to ask ourselves, are we afraid of it? How have you witnessed the tolerated sins of the tongue hurt you or the church? Is it impactful enough to take seriously the consequences of treating it as a secondary sin issue? When I say secondary, I mean it's actually not necessarily even secondary. I mean it's in the bottom of most of our lists. At least I'm not, fill in the blank. But have you ever thought, thank God I'm not a slanderer? Praise God for keeping me from being gossip. When you experience it, when you're on the receiving end of it, you understand full well how hurtful it is. And so is it worth our time and effort to make sure that in the life of the church, we protect the integrity of the body, we protect each other's integrity as individuals by using our tongues wisely? So using it the right way, here's where we're finishing up. James 3, 9 through 12. With it, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So what James is getting at here is he's saying, to you, Christian people, to you who profess faith in Jesus, you think about the fact you have a changed heart. If Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, what is in your heart? If your heart has been changed by Jesus to honor him, to glorify him, that should be reflected in your words. So for those whose whole lives have been redeemed by Christ, our hearts and therefore our tongues have been set apart to reflect God-glorifying, Christ-exalting priorities. Now to be clear here, and I want to be really clear about this, this doesn't mean that you can't joke around with a friend. It doesn't mean that you have to speak Bible verses 24 hours a day Okay, some people are liable to this. Some people have this sense of, of we'll, we'll genuinely call it legalism here. It sets in, they think, man, I can't speak any unfruitful words. I, I have to make sure every word I speak is biblical. I can cripple somebody, and that's not the heart of the matter here. The heart of the matter is saying, are you using words wisely? Are you using them rightly? Are you using them in the context they're supposed to be used? Okay? There are some people that I am really close with that if I say something like, oh, shut up, it's not going to be anything bad to them because they know the context. If I go to a stranger and I say, oh, shut up, that might come across as really harsh because they have no idea the context. Are you using words wisely? Are you using them rightly? You have to be wise, and wisdom means looking for opportunity to apply truth in a way that makes sense biblically. Use words wisely. Ephesians 4, 29, that no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Again, I want to be clear here. I don't think the Apostle Paul is saying, avoid saying the F word. I mean, avoid it. Don't say it, to be clear. Don't go out and F-bomb your way through tomorrow. Don't do that. 
But what Paul is saying more here is corrupting talk. I don't think that I'm going to be too corrupted if somebody comes and says, F this to me. I'll be like, wow, that was gross and crass and crude and inappropriate, but it's not going to corrupt me. But you know what's going to corrupt me? Is if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, did you hear this? Did you hear this about that person? That's corrupting talk. And the reason it corrupts is because it's putting thoughts and ideas in your mind about somebody else that's going to take off. And like James says, we use our tongues to slander those created in the image of God. That's corrupting talk. And so when Paul says, don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouths, he says, there's an alternative. Use words to build others up. Use words that speak well of others. And especially, you think about the church, especially you think about other Christian people. One of the great privileges you have as a Christian is to believe the best about your brothers and sisters. That's a great privilege you have to think, this person is indwelt by the same spirit as me. They screw up, I screw up, but boy, I can give them the benefit of the doubt. In 1 Corinthians 13, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You love that brother or sister, give them the benefit of the doubt. So when corrupting talk comes out of somebody's mouth, you think, man, I have no time for that whatsoever. Instead, I'm gonna hear these words, I'm gonna throw them away, and I'm gonna choose to use words that says, you know what? I'm going to look past this stuff. I'm going to speak words that are building others up. Because that glorifies God. There's a time to speak words that tear things down, but it's tearing garbage down. It's tearing sin down. It's not tearing people down for the sake of self-glorification. A little bit more extended statement that's going to be bring us to our close. Paul says to the church at Colossae, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, and these you too once walked when you were living in them. So it's easy for us to look at verses five through seven and say, okay, good. Uh, no affairs, no this, no that, whatever. That's it's good. Got it covered. But he continues to say this. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, scooty and slave free, but Christ is all and in all. So again, Paul is saying, you look at your brothers and sisters in Christ, you look at the church and think, I don't have time to live the way I used to live with my speech. At one point, I used my words to just tear others down. I used my words to say things that were building me up. I used words to do things that would accomplish the purposes for me. I would lie with my words to get my way. I would get what I wanted by using my words. Paul says, you don't have time to live like that anymore. He says, look at the church. Look at this diversity of people in the church. You look at that and think, I have no time to use my words to destroy what God has made. Instead, I'm to use my words differently. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So here's the heart. Here's the heart. And how does it get expressed? That the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Use words. Be thankful. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you see how important words are here to reflect a changed heart? Be thankful. How do you express thanksgiving? Use your words. This is not some cheesy sit around the Thanksgiving table like, give me one thing you're thankful for. That's not it. It's a thankful heart. It's been changed by God. And that's reflected in your words, saying things. Man, I am so thankful for this. Genuinely thankful. Your words are going to reflect the fact that God has done something in you. And then you think, how does that rub off on people around you? This is a common problem, especially when it comes to the workplace. It's so easy, so easy to join in and complain. So easy to join in. 
what kind of a witnessing difference would it make if this person said, man, that's a Christian. He does, says the same stuff I do. So he says, that's a Christian, and all he seems to talk about is how thankful he is every day. Do you think that has any impact on somebody else? You may annoy them till kingdom come. You may irritate them all day long, but boy, it's different than anything they're going to see other ways. Your words have a witnessing impact just in the nature of them. But finally, I want you to see here how our words are supposed to be used to really be the centerpiece of bringing God glory and how we relate to others. This is in response to the salvation that the people of God receive. Isaiah says this, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Use your words. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Do you see here how the proper response to receiving the grace of God and the gospel is to use your mouth and open it for him? Why is it that we're so quick to gossip about somebody else and we feel so afraid to talk about Jesus? Why do we feel so timid to say, well, I just don't think that I could risk a relationship. I just, I don't think I could say this without really kind of jeopardizing something. And yet we can say, man, I heard about that guy I work with. Did you hear about that guy? He did this, what a loser. Why is it so easy? God didn't save you to use your words like that. He saved you so that you can go into your workplace and say, yesterday at church, I heard about Jesus. I want you to hear about Jesus too. I've received this great gift of forgiveness and mercy and I just want to, I want to talk about how God has done that. I want to use my words for that purpose. So as we wrap up this Christ to Culture series, I want us to be left with the fact that not only do we look at the culture around us, try to understand it, look at the culture in the church. Look at your own heart. And I do think this is probably one of the biggest sin issues that the church deals with as a whole. I don't mean there's all kinds of slanderers and gossips in this local church, but I would say it's a tolerated sin within the evangelical church. It parades itself as prayer requests. It parades itself as concerned words of conversation with somebody else. And that's nothing except useless word garbage. So this week, next week, the week thereafter, I just want you to think about this. How am I using this that has a potential to start big forest fires to put fires out? How am I using this to help kindle a passion for Jesus in other people? You you can tell jokes. We have a fantasy draft tonight. I'm going to joke about stuff. I'm going to laugh and that's fine. But how is it happening? How is it happening? Use this thing wisely. Okay. So we're going to pray. We're going to close in song. We're going to use our mouths to sing praises to God together. And we will jet. Father, we thank you that you have made us in your image. And you have, in making us in your image, given us the ability to use our words in a way that is pleasing to you. And we have all myself included, used words really foolishly at times. We've used words to hurt people. We've used words to be selfish and to get our way with things. And as James says, this ought not be. We want, we want hearts that have been turned to fresh water from salt water to be life-giving springs that others can consider who you are and consider what a changed life looks like. We want to see that more. And so as much as we've talked about the culture around us these past several weeks, we think about the culture that we deal with within the church and say, Lord, please change us. Please so work in us by your spirit that we are convinced that the best way to speak 
is the way you've called us to speak. So please receive what we offer up to you here now, Lord, with words that come from our mouths, from refreshed hearts, changed hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.